Hello there! In this lesson, we'll be showing you how to create the illusion of a metallic reflection using oil paints to create a still life. For most still lifes, you'll need a setter to paint from. Now, I bought this old coffee pot and milk jug from my local second hand shop. And if you'd like to try this project, then we've supplied a pretty good photo that you can download from the PDF. I'm also putting a lemon in my setter. This way we can explore the reflections and also because it's mainly made up of greys, it'll add a little splash of colour. Once we're happy with the setter, we'll start drawing up the image. We're using a painting board this time because the smooth surface makes it ideal for fine detail work with oils. It's important to seal timber before you start painting because it can be quite absorbent. Although we are painting our still life in oils, I like to use acrylics for this stage because they dry so quickly. Use a mix of yellow ochre and burnt sienna and then add umber into any areas of shadow. For this type of project, you'll need a good range of brushes. I'm using our premium brush wallet, which includes both high quality Taclon and hog bristle brushes. With oil painting, the general rule of thumb is to paint from dark to light. I'm using Mars Black here because it's warmer than ivory black and I think it gives colours a more convincing look. I block in all the dark tone I can see to make sure that all of our demarcations or boundaries between tones are clearly set out. This is pretty important because generally speaking artworks that feature metallic surfaces often have blocks of solid colours that don't blend with each other. For ornate areas like the handle here it's best to fully block in the area and lay lighter colours on top. It's also important to lay these first dark tones on quite thinly so that any lighter colour that you lay on top doesn't become too contaminated. Lightly scrub on any areas that will be blended with another tone. This will make it easier for you to create smooth transitions. Once the black is in, we can start to apply the white. I always use titanium white as the tone of zinc white doesn't quite have the tinting strength and tends to be a little translucent. Again, look closely at the tones in your setup and lay the white onto the top of the coffee pot. This coffee pot lid has a cone shape and although the top is flooded with light, the central area closest to you has two oval shapes that are darker than the surrounding area. As paintings go, this one has quite a limited palette, but there are so many subtle variances of grey that it's still an interesting piece. Slowly add a darker tone, then lighten, constantly referring to your setup. This coffee pot has a very ornate top on it. Painting elements like this can be confusing, mainly because people tend to overthink how they can accurately portray them. Keep it simple and only put in the information that you can see. Realistically, you only need to add a highlight of white where the light hits the high points of the lid. The dark tones for all the hollows are already there. Once the top of the coffee pot is complete, we can move to the central part. This part curves inwards and then the coffee pot becomes larger at the base. If you look closely, you can see the whole studio is reflected into this surface. It's just a bit distorted because of the shape. You can also see the reflection of our table displayed upside down towards the top of the pot. Mix the greys up to the pure white block that directly faces the light source. Just like we did with our ornate coffee top, we can simplify the body too. The more information you put in doesn't necessarily make for a better painting, but of course we're going to include the elements like our tabletop, the lemon, milk jug and the easel because that's all part of the natural reflection. The back side of the jug is in shadow, but because it's cylindrical, we're going to highlight it subtly to get the right effect. Remember to mix your lighter tones into your darker tones whenever you can, because it's easy to conceal or lose a colour by mixing black into white. If this happens, you can scrape off the paint with a palette knife and start again. The last step is to drop our pure white highlights in. Just like the lid on our coffee pot, the handle is also very busy, but again we can simplify it and handle it in the same way. There's some really good reference material out there on painting light. Try searching how the Dutch masters created the look of gold in their paintings to get an idea of their methods. You'll notice the jump from darks straight to highlights. You'll also notice the bigger the difference between shadow and highlight, the more effective the illusion. The Dutch masters would often craft their works over many months, building up many translucent layers on top of one another. 
our project is being completed a la prima, which basically means wet on wet in one sitting, but the approach is essentially the same. You'll notice I've used the neutral grey in certain areas of the project, mainly to create reflected shadow. You'll find all of the colours used in the project in our downloadable PDF. Sometimes you'll need to rest your hand on an area that has already been painted. You can easily make your own mild stick to rest on by cutting the finger off a rubber glove and putting a large brush handle inside it. Then bind the glove finger onto the handle. The bottom part of our coffee pot is a compound curve. The reflected image in a compound curve is often distorted, causing the reflection to bend around the curve. Our table is reflected into this surface as well as the shape of the lemon. Painting the unique reflection in a shiny compound curve has been explored by many artists. MC Escher created a fantastic self-portrait that suggests the phenomenon really well. Another thing you'll notice from our setup is that the curved bottom of the pot has a dark tone that transitions into the light of the reflected tablecloth. We'll colour the lemon with lemon yellow darkened with a little dark grey. Our coffee pot is sitting on a fancy base with four legs. The back side of this is in shadow, so we're going to handle it the same way as with the other ornate parts of the pot, laying the black down first, then building up our lighter tones on top. Then we add our highlights, and this is the best part, as it just comes to life. using titanium white, lemon yellow, yellow deep, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna and crimson red. Start by creating a mix of lemon yellow and yellow deep and paint in the top part of the lemon. Next, mix in a touch of ultramarine blue and paint in the lemon's underside. This will be reflected light in shadow. Then create a transition between the colours. 
add a touch of crimson red and burnt sienna to the mix and paint it into the shadow side of the lemon, leaving the underside free of this colour, then blend the tones smooth. Create a mix from lemon yellow and titanium white and lay it into the top side of the lemon. This will be in highlight. Dab this coat on quite thickly to suggest the lemon's rough skin. Texture is important to realism as it creates a very clear contrast from the smooth metal coffee pot and milk jug. Now, very sparingly, apply straight titanium white to the top part of the lemon, being careful not to overmix this. Then finally dab on more titanium white to create highlights. Don't make the shapes too consistent. We want it to look realistic. By this stage, our three main elements are complete and we can start on our background. We want the tablecloth to look quite thin, so start by laying on a dark grey for the shadow areas in the folds of cloth and any cast shadows. Our light is coming from the left, so our shadows will fall on the right. Create a mix of titanium white with a touch of ultramarine blue and scrub it onto the surface, moving from left, darkening the white with a touch of Mars black as you go. Make sure the amount of paint applied is minimal so the tint underneath the coat is slightly visible. By the time you reach the right side, the tone is quite a few shades darker. Try to use the largest brush you can, switching to a smaller brush for those fine detail areas. Be careful not to make any of your cast shadows too severe. Shadows tend to be cool, so mix a little ultramarine blue into the grey mix. Reapply white into any areas that are a little bit too dark. And finally, add some pure white over the top to create your highlights. This last step is especially important to show the shape of the folds of our fabric. The fabric folds in our still life are quite simple because we're concentrating on painting metallic surfaces. But if you'd like to learn more about painting folds in fabric, leave a message in the comments section of this lesson and you never know we might create one. We're going to create our background in the same way as our tablecloth only we'll be applying the paint thicker and the tone will be considerably darker. Backgrounds are really important as they frame the subject. The colour and tonal value can make the subject recede or appear closer to the viewer. I think it's best to start light and darken until you're happy with the effect. Many of the old masters still life works featured very dark backgrounds, but for this tutorial I wanted to portray a brightly lit still life like it looks in the studio. Well, thanks for watching. We hope you picked up some useful tips for painting those tricky metallic surfaces and we'll see you next time.